right, hello IT201. Um, this is Feb 24th. Here we are in this week. We're a week into starting Sprint 2. Uh, remember last week we did our Sprint 1 drop. Um, we went over the user interface, um, making sure there's a finished WebGL build. I introduced this clock tutorial. I thought it was really good because it reintroduced all the fundamental knowledge of um, where we currently are using Unity, C Sharp, um, object-oriented and component-based design. And um, I thought it'd be nice to um, do some videos. I'm gonna try doing the videos before the class. So it's the Sunday before the class. I'm, currently developing a few more features um, in my build um, uh, and I'm going to go through them and I'm going to actually build out their diagrams. So I thought why not just do it in the video um, and let you follow along and actually create your own. So since uh, Sprint 1 was about three weeks long, and this looks like it's going to be about four weeks long and then Yes, the deliverables are at the end, the Sunday at the end of spring break. Um, but this is for those who need that extra week for other classes, what have you. But you should really have one week, two week, three week, four week, and just do your drop. But uh, the drop is at the end of spring break to give you that time if you need it. So this sprint to user flow diagram, remember these were the, the three main user flows we created for Sprint 1. And then we actually programmed that out and we did a WebGL build and we had an interactive demo up on HIO. Um, and then embedded the code in our Moodle form posting and, and made it playable right in our posting. Um, this Sprint, we're, we're gonna have more features. Um, a lot of the features are a small to medium in size. Um, I'm not sure the amount yet. I'm, I'm going to aim around five or six, I'm thinking, but I've actually written out what I plan to do over these coming weeks. Um, and um, I'm going to make the user flows now. And we'll see how many we get. And then in class, we'll, we'll figure out the final scope of the sprint too. So since we have these three user flows, I'm just going to put a box around them just to kind of cordon them off. Now notice when I draw the box, first off, since it's the most recent element we created in this draw IO app. So again, we're in Google Drive folder. Um, and if you go to new, if you don't have dry, draw IO connected, you have to go to connect more apps, search for it, and you can connect it. That is the app I'm currently in. I just drew this rectangle. It's the first one. I'm sorry, the last that we've created, so it gets rendered on top. But you see this arrange here, two back. We can send it as the last of them. It's in the arrange tab here, you can do the same. So this arrange up top here, and this arrange over here is doing the same functionality. So anyway, I'll just resize it a little bit. Let me undo that. Click on it so I get these scaling tabs. And this is position nice. I'm just going to add a text at the top. So let's see if the text element, yeah, it'll be rendered on top. I don't have to worry about um, arranging it, but I'll just call this my um, Sprint 1 user flows. All right. The text box needs to be scaled out. Remember, if you hold down control as you do it, you'll get a scaling from the center. So it can just stay centered up. And I'll move it so that alignment hit. Um, and now we have one section. This is our sprint one. And I'll move over to the side. And we can start to generate sprint two. So in this one, we had a main, the main painting workflow. And we had the user interface that dealt with changing the primitive and the user interface that dealt with changing the color. Each of them were discrete, separated out with a start and an end. Um, and we have like one primary activity, and these are kind of two modification. They're kind of secondary to this one. They allow for more features, more additional variation on this primary user flow. So more functionality pulled from this primary one. We kind of have a similar situation in Sprint 2. 
So maybe I'll just move down to underneath it. Um, you can orient yours as you wish. Just make sure they're clean as you export them out. So I will take a text box, drop that here. And the areas I'm focusing on are destruction. So remember last week we were going over uh, the script that we created. And oops, that's steam. There we go. So um, we have a left click to destroy an object that we click on that we find a collider. We have, um, we want to modify the timer. So we want to turn it on and off. So toggle time destroy. Also a quick note on this script so I don't have to reference it later. I realized that my my method started with a lowercase. So that's reserved more for, for variables. So I just went through and, and uppercased them, and I'm going to have to go through and just make sure when you when you change the name of a method, these UI elements connect to them. And if I hunt down here, you see this missing. So I, I uppercase them. So they're all camel case. So if the variables have start with the lowercase and go through camel case, um, and the method calls, the methods have uppercase camel case, to, and that's an easy way to distinguish between them. So I ch did change my method names. So just note that I need to go back and say, okay, nope, slider red means change red. So notice that I labeled everything and this is where it comes in handy. Yes, it's a little upfront work, slows you down at the beginning. So normally people avoid it, but you're always gonna come to issues where you have to change around your code. So there's bugs and you have to hunt them around. That hunting activity, you can reduce the load time on that if you just go through that initial proper naming of everything. So see, it's how easy it is for me to connect my UI element to this method on a, a, a separate script, that's on a separate object, and it's easy to reconnect. Um, besides uh, bug fixing or bug hunting, we do, um, this might be considered a refactoring. This is something we haven't talked about yet, where a refactoring is, is as you're building out your code base, um, either individually or with a, a group, um, as the the systems you're building, the the scripts, the classes get more complicated, elaborate, and you start connecting with other scripts, other methods, maybe from another developer, you might need to refactor, meaning you might need to change names, you might need to change input um, if that your methods accepting or or return statements that the method is sending back out based on what other people need. Um, and for example, you might start off with making your variables public so that they're very easy for you to modify. So this whole process actually that we went through where we made variables um, hard coded, we didn't know what we wanted. We just put numbers in, right in our, our lines, our command lines in our script. And then as we noticed we wanted to change them, we kind of changed them to public variables so that we can mess around with them in the inspector. And then we said, well, that's not good it's we shouldn't make them public let's make them serialized field and then change them to private so each of these steps we're kind of refactoring our script we're reorganizing them um so whenever these changes happen when you go from a script that's that's in a some type of working state and you're modifying it so that it works with other code or that is just better coding practices we'll call this refactoring reorganizing our code and that happens consistently throughout the life of a project and um, even into maintenance mode of it. So just get into that upfront work, that renaming, reorganization. It'll make your life a lot easier. These, these bases of code that you're gonna work with throughout the length of our class, All right, and also these portfolio pieces that you're developing for your job hunt when you leave college, and also when you become a, an intern or an entry level developer, you, you just need to get these habits focused in now. So think about that as I'm reconnecting these scripts and seeing how easy it is for me to see what needs to connect. So these sliders are good. Looks like slider size I already did. The destroy button, he's missing. Um, let's see, destroy all. I got a, oh, here we go, destroy objects. 
Our drop down primitive is missing. Change shape. This slider I haven't I haven't put a name on it yet, so this means that this hasn't been built out. It's in semi semi constructed state. Um, toggle time destroyer. Okay, that has to deal with. Uh, he's already connected. Uh, deal with um, whether we're allowed. These objects are going to have a timer on them or not. So now that I went through and I reconnected my UI, I'm just going to save my scene because we did a big step. Um, I also go through and just so you're aware, I'm actually um, using a version control system using um, GitHub. And every time I do a major change, I do a commit and I and I label it so I know what happened and then there's a history to it. So we're not kind of getting into version control and GitHub in this class, maybe in future iterations. But just know that I can, it's just very easy for me to track my changes and go back and forward um, on a project. All right, so I reconnected my user interface, everything works. And I will get back to my user flows. So now we have this area of destruction, which uh, I created a left click to destroy something that currently exists. I, I created this ability to turn on and off my time destroy. Eventually, I want to get to the point of modifying the actual timer. So right now, it's just it's just hard coded to three seconds, which um, let's make that more appropriate for developers to modify for the user to mess around with. We'll get that into our user interface. Um, and the ability to turn on and off this timer function and the clear button. So that covers everything. Great. So we have this kind of major workflow area that we're going to talk about. And I'm just going to label it destruction. Um, maybe from a user's perspective, maybe it's more like a clear, a object clearing functionality. I'll say paint, since we're labeling as a paint program, I'll say paint object um, clearing functionality. You can always change this name later. Since I'm not centering it up to anything right now, I don't have to worry about holding down that control key. And this is gonna be one area. I'll let, we'll move it over here. I'll probably have to state that we're in I'll resist sprint one user flows. All right, we're in sprint two user flows. I'm not sure the size of this yet. I'm just kind of reorienting stuff down here. I mean, if you want, you can, we'll draw out a box, but it's gonna change a lot at this point. So I usually hold this on to the end, but if you want to, we can draw our box to start to organize the fact that we're in sprint two. And under a range, I click back to move it into the back. And uh, let's move this over. This is going to be one area. So my paint object clearing functionality or destruction, whichever way you want to label it. For now, I'm just going to put a box around it. And that box, oops, I sent it behind it. Let me send this to the back. There we go. So I'm just gonna center it up to this box. Now, within this paint object functionality, we actually have a few user flows we're gonna specify here. So I'll bring out another text. This one, I'm gonna call it um, our left click to destroy. So maybe um, clear existing individual objects. Um, I'm not gonna do a full line like that. I'll do like a, a double line. Um, it'll, it kind of makes it a little easier. It's shorter length. I don't want it to be very uh, horizontally long. So we know that we have a clear um, all existing objects. This is groups. This needs to be objects. All right. Spelling error. 
clear. I'll follow the convention of this one at all was before existing. So clear individual existing objects and then clear all existing objects. Open up a little bit. There we go. So you get a two liner. Now what else do we have here? We have um, clear individual, clear all, and we have a time destroy. So um, we could pull the idea of turning on and off time destroy to really meaning infinite time. Um, so in that case, I feel like I can kind of group both on instead of having one where it's timer on off and then another one where it's set length of timer. Um, I could think about the fact of combining the two. Um, maybe for to keep it easy right now, they'll keep them separate. So say um, set call this um, enable disable timed clear for now. And let me see if the alt, alt, alt doesn't work. Okay, control. You can hold control and drag up. You notice how they're all kind of keeping them lined up. So we're going to enable disable. This one is going to maybe set is a good word for this. Set timed clear length. Set length. Set timed clear. say set time to clear length okay so these two are kind of linked um, and these two are kind of linked so this one goes over here oh you know what I'm gonna move these out this is gonna be another box here um, oh. I thought this is part of the clearing functionality I have a little list right here paint strokes all right so this is our destruction. Kind of four user flows, although this uh, they're very similar related. Um, so maybe in the future I might morph these together, but I'll say that these are four. Okay. So now I have to create my user flows diagram like this. I'm going to pause it now, see if I can figure this out. So I'm going to start by just snagging down a few of these. All right, I'm going to build these out and see if I pause it. Yep, we'll continue this on in another video.